Hello, everybody, and welcome back to The Advisor with Stacey Chalemi. Today, I'm very excited because we have a very special guest today. It's Coach Guy Gain. He also has a podcast on our channel, so make sure you check it out. He has amazing insight and wisdom, and he's going to share some with you today. And he's going to show you some tools and techniques that you could apply to your own life to help you grow and really improve your overall self. So I'm going to give the the stage to Guy, and he's going to share with you some great things that you'll really appreciate. So Guy, tell everybody a little about yourself and what you do. Okay. Uh, thank you again for having me on your show again, Stacey. I appreciate it. Uh, you know, from uh, for those that did not hear us the last time, um, I was a stockbroker for many, many years. I've been in the financial field for 34 years. And uh, I started uh, just as an average broker, um, you know, learning the trade, smiling and dialing, making 100 phone calls a day, uh, you know, picking out a stock that uh, I was uh, talking to clients about and so on. And as time went on and I learned the business more and more, um, I decided I had gone to a couple of different firms. And uh, over the years, I had finally decided after about, you know, about 15, 16 years, that uh, what I should do is go out on my own. I had clients that had followed me from um, the different brokerage firms. And I'd been with just a couple, but they had followed me from one brokerage firm to another. And I really thought that, uh, first of all, the commissions would be much better, you know, on my own. And the other thing was, is that uh, what was always happening in, in uh, new companies is, or new brokerage firms, excuse me, they wanted you to sell their particular funds or their particular uh, stocks that they had done uh, IPOs, which is uh, initial public offerings. So I really wanted to go out on my own and be able to open up um, uh, in really a way that would give people an opportunity to get unbiased uh, uh, advice. So uh, I uh, grew my company from really two people, and uh, I eventually ended up with uh, four offices on the East Coast, uh, Buffalo, Jupiter. Uh, Buffalo was where my, um, my main office was, uh, Jupiter, Florida, uh, Boston, and excuse me, uh, New York City. And um, we uh, had an office up in Maine, in Kennebunk, Maine, and we were opening up another office in uh, in uh, Boston. Uh, but at that time, and this was, uh, takes us up to 2008, um, what had happened is it came to um, light that a couple of my brokers had been misleading our investors. And I didn't know that. And I didn't find out until the United States government walked through the door and raided my office in May of 2008. And um, uh, I explained a lot of this in our first podcast. But the thing is, is that uh, I vehemently denied that I knew anything about it. And uh, I got accused of, uh, I, actually, I got indicted on 51 counts. Uh, they took a couple of years after they came into my office to do that. Um, you know, I, I argued, I fought, I pled. Uh, literally, I ended up pleading, but that wasn't what I meant. I ended up, you know, trying to convince these people that, hey, I never, I never instructed my employees to do that, because when these folks got caught, uh, they just, you know, the get out of uh, jail card was to blame the boss, uh, mm -hmm. and so um, uh, they said that I instructed them to do that, and uh, of course, I never did. Actually, Stacy, if you might remember, I uh, mentioned I passed a couple of polygraph tests, and. Um, uh, the government knew that I was innocent, but in any event, I ended up uh, spending um, 13 years. Uh, I, I got a 13-year prison sentence, and uh, I was able to get out after, I quote, unquote, only nine years because uh, there was some new legislation that had come down while I was in prison that allowed me to get out early, and I had never had any incidents or problems in prison. Um, and so uh, I came home. I've been home now uh, over four years. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm completely clear and no probation or anything like that now. So, you know, what I've, I've done is, of course, as you and I have talked uh, off the uh, camera, is um, when I came home, Stacy, I came home to nothing. Everything that I had, uh, all the money that I had, and I made a very, very good income as a broker. Uh, actually, I was a registered investment advisor as well. And I know we spoke about that the last time uh, too, but um, everything that I own, my home's uh, my money, uh, my family, everything was torn apart. Uh, I, did, I came home to nothing. Uh, fortunately, uh, my children were still there, and I was able to live with my son and his family And uh, while I was on um, home confinement. Uh, it was very difficult, you know, to come home to nothing. I mean, zero. 
it, the, the, I think the worst part was is to lose my reputation because when the uh, media got a hold of everything, they only were able to listen to the government's um, view and the government's story. And there's an adage that we all hear all the time, what you say can and will be used against you. So as a defendant, I mean, uh, you know, you're not a, a, an ex-president that can say and do what they want and get away with that. Uh, when you're just an average guy, uh, anything that you say, you can literally get really in a lot of a lot bigger problems than you had going in. I actually had somebody come into my office from one of the local um, uh, newspapers uh, after everything had happened, and he wanted you know my statement. And I said I would love to talk with you. I, I and I, I really would have, uh, but I said I can't. I said I have to let you talk to my attorney. And uh, uh, as he walked out of the door. Uh, I asked him, I said, well, what are you going to, what are you going to print? And he got real smart aleck with me and uh, like uh, put his uh, head over his shoulder and said, well, you're not going to want to put it in your scrapbook. But he was wrong. Or he was wrong. I, I did put it in my scrapbook because what I did is I took all of the things that were said negative about me and all of those things I tried to make good out of everything that I had seen. You know, once I went to prison, Stacy, I had a lot of the professional uh, people that were there, uh, as well, doctors, attorneys, accountants, business people of various types, uh, st other stockbrokers, and so on. And um, after a while, uh, I kind of become became an elder statesman with some of these people, and they come over to me. They used to my 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 nickname in prison was Gino, and uh, even though my last name doesn't sound like we're Italian, but uh, it was the Yobanishi is the last name. I always like to put that plug in. But um, uh, the thing is, is that uh, um, in prison. Uh, I would I would get some of these people that would come over and had long faces. And it got to the point where guys would tease me and call me St. Gino, the patron saint of lost causes, because they, I always seemed to be the guy that, you know, could talk to people. But, you know, I had been through it and I knew what they were feeling. And I told them, you know, from the very beginning, I said, you know, you've gotten a blessing that you don't realize yet. Oh, yeah. What do you mean? I said, well, I said, now you know who, who your friends are. And now you know who really loves you. Because boy, I'll tell you, Stacy, before everything happened, man, I was the most popular guy in Buffalo. You know, everybody knew me. Everybody wanted to be around me. Everybody, you know, I had my own radio show. I had been on TV, uh, you know, in, in the good way uh, yeah. at that point up until then. But, you know, the thing is, is that in every adversity, I came to find through the College of Hard Knocks, I came yeah. to find that there is always something good that comes out of it. And, you know, I, I think we talked about this the last time, but I'd like to just mention this again if we did. After the government had come in, I, I was a pretty big guy back then. I was way overweight. I was too busy to do anything. I used to work out years ago, but I got so busy that I stopped. And, of course, I was going to start on Monday, and Monday never got there. But, yeah. um, you know, by the time the government came in, uh, I had really gained a lot of weight, had not worked out for a long, long time. And um, uh, I ended up after the government came in, I ended up having a heart attack and I had, I had put uh, the, the chest pains uh, off to stress and, you know, and guys don't like to admit they're not feeling good anyway. Uh, so this went on, these chest pains went on for a couple of weeks and um, I finally uh, ended up having a, a, a major heart attack. And uh, when I, when I got to the hospital, uh, just barely, if, um, you know, I, I, if I would have waited any more time, I probably, you know, wouldn't have made it. But, uh, anyway, when I got to the emergency room, uh, I remember looking at the clock, it was five 30 in the morning and I fell asleep and it was great because if anybody's been to the hospital, uh, and they try to get some sleep, it's almost impossible because it just seems when you finally close your eyes and you're finally able to sleep, somebody's going to poke you or wake you up or whatever. And, um, I had a nurse, uh, in the ER, uh, putting an oxygen mask over my face. And uh, she said, welcome back. I said, what? She said, we lost you. We brought you back with the defibrillators. I said, really? Wow. And they had gone out and told my son who had brought me to the hospital that morning uh, that I had actually died. But apparently they just kept working on uh, on me, which I thought was very strange. Why would people go out and tell somebody that you know, until they're declared dead? I mean, he went yeah. spastic when that happened. Anyway, uh, when I got to prison, uh, I, and I, I, I arrived in prison back in October of 2011. Uh, when I got to prison, um, I went to the medical department a few days later, and I happened to be talking to a doctor who was examining, examining me. 
And he said, uh, you know, Mr. Gain, he said, I was a cardiologist in my in my profession. He said, I'm retired now. He said, I do contract work for the government. Uh, he said, I noticed you had a, a heart attack because I had all my medical records sent there. And yeah. I said, yeah, I did. And he said, uh, and they brought you back with, with the defibrillators. I said, yeah. He said, you know, everybody thinks they work all the time. He said, they work less than 2% of the time. And I'll never forget what he said to me that day. He said, you know, God has a special plan for you. And of course, I got smart mouthed with him and said, yeah, I got 13 years. He said, no. He said, God has got a special plan for you. And I couldn't really, I mean, it was nice to hear, although I really didn't believe it. Um, but, you know, I, I as those as the years went by, uh, I began to think, you know what? I have to give something back and hopefully I'll make it out of here. I mean, Stacey, can you imagine you walk into prison and when I had a chance to talk to my case manager, now this is October of 2011. Right. And she says to me, uh, well, you know, she's looking at the computer and she said, you know, Mr. Gain, I guess you're going to be our guest until uh, February 23rd of 2023. To hear that in 2011, that would be like today, you know, hearing, well, you're going to be with us until 2037 or 2037. How do you wrap your head around that? Yeah. You know, but in any event, the thing is, is that, uh, you know, time did go on and uh, I wrote some books, as you know, and um, I mentored other inmates. I taught classes. I really kept active. I was very active in, in the Christian community within the uh, prison. Uh, I was at a couple of different prisons I got transferred to. And, um, you know, I really I think I grew in a way I know I did in a way that I would never, ever have expected. And, you know, now today, uh, I try to pass on that knowledge, what I went through and the mistakes that I made. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But the mistakes that I made, uh, you know, I try to when I, I deal with business clients, because I'm also a business consultant, you know, I try to take the things that the experiences that I had and help other businesses. And it's amazing because when I talk to other businessmen, you know, they kind of say the same things I used to back then. Yeah, 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 I know. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, you're right. And just blow it off. But I'm, I don't let them get away with that because I tell them, no, no, you have to understand why I'm telling you this. You have to understand the ramifications of being naive or being uh, ignorant of what's going on within your company. And as I always say to people, it's easy to start a business and it's mm -hmm. easy kind of to run a business at the beginning. Right. The difficult thing is to know what not to do in your business. And that's mm -hmm. where I so not only can I help you start the business and, and and ratchet it up, but to help you avoid all the icebergs that, you know, I ended up hitting. Right. And, and, you know, that's an amazing story. And, you know, a lot of people, you know, wouldn't, you know, would have gave up a long time ago. They would have, mm -hmm. they, you know, they wouldn't, you know, you, you, you didn't give up. You fought and fought and fought and you were going to get through it. And, you know, as soon as you came out, you know, and, and, I, and I'm assuming it must have been a very difficult tra you know, transition to go from, you know, you went from, you know, having the lime life to them being incarcerated and mm -hmm. not having and being confined and then mm -hmm. coming out and all these different changes, you know, in society and then everything that you worked so hard to gain was taken away from you. So you yeah. had to start from scratch again yeah. in a world that you were t probably was totally unfamiliar to, you know, to because, yeah. you know, I would mention, you know, there was the world that changed so much in those nine years. You know, how did it feel to go from from one, you know, one world extreme? To yeah, one extreme, really, in one world. Exactly. You know, I had been in my career so blessed because I made a great deal of money and I could go into a store and, you know, I just pick out things. I mean, it just, you know, you just, I want this, I want that, I'm going to pick this. And I was no shopaholic, but you know, I liked nice things. So if I wanted to, you know, something, I, I got it. And yeah, I looked at the price, but that didn't stop me. Um, after, after the government came in, uh, they froze all of my assets. They wouldn't even release it so I could get a private attorney. I ended up with a federal public defender who these gentlemen and ladies have, you know, case upon case, 10, 20 at a time. And it's yeah. all I kept hearing was plead, plead, plead. I said, I'm not going to plead to something I didn't do, uh, which I ended up doing a few years later anyway, to avoid an even bigger sentence as I came to find out. Um, but uh, the thing is, is that um, uh, after everything happened, we couldn't even, we, we couldn't go to the store. We didn't have any money. 
And um, I was married at the time. And, uh, you know, we went to food pantries. I mean, you talk about humbling. We went to food pantries. We had donations given to us. Uh, you know, people that I would see on the outside, you know, I didn't want to go out. You know, I wanted to stay home. But the few times that I went out, uh, I had people spit at me. I had people push me around I, physically. And I mean that physically push me around. Uh, people actually spit at me, as I said. Um, you know, so all of these things, I tried to get a job. Uh, I couldn't work in my business anymore. And yeah. uh, I, I actually, I applied to, I think I look back, I think it was 14 or 15 companies. I think it was 14. I had actually gotten a job. And the job that they hired me for was a night janitor at a bowling alley. And I was supposed to start, I remember I went on that interview on a Thursday and I was supposed to start Sunday, Sunday night yeah. at 1030. And uh, I got a letter from them on Saturday saying that the job offer was rescinded because of uh, negative uh, things that they found in my background, which obviously I knew about. And they did too. Anyway, uh, I could I can honestly say back in those days, I couldn't get a job washing toilets. And that's, and that's the truth. But you know, the thing is, is that you form a different type of character. And this yeah. is another thing that I used to say to the people that would come into prison. You know, okay, you might not be able to be a doctor anymore, but that doesn't take away your knowledge. That You yes. know, yeah, I'm part of the baby boomer generation and we don't want to get old. I don't care how, you know, if you're anywhere between now the age of 60 and I think it's 78 or something like that, it doesn't matter. But, you know, we didn't want to get old. And I told these guys, I said, you know, these health clinics are popping up all over, these wellness clinics. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not talking about critical care. I'm talking about wellness, you know, the vitamins, yeah. the supplements and all of that. I said, why don't you just start something like that? And, you know, work to that, I, you know, have doctors work for you. All right. You don't have your license, but you have your knowledge. Or, yeah. you know, with an attorney, you know, go work at a law office and you can do appeal work or, you know, whatever. But you yeah. can't give up because when you give up, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with the book, um, A Man's Search for Meaning by uh, Dr. Uh, Victor Frankel. It was written, uh, Dr. Frankel was a, a psychiatrist uh, and uh, he lived in, I believe he lived in Vienna uh, before the war. And uh, being Jewish, he was um, he was arrested and put in a concentration camp. And uh, Dr. Frankel was an amazing individual. And I, I read the book while I was inside. But yeah. what he spoke about was the people that had hope were the ones that were able to survive. But the yeah. people that gave up, I actually have chills talking about it right now, because the people that gave up, they, they just, they did, they gave up. They gave into the circumstances, which were horrific. And I'm certainly not pointing a finger. I can't even imagine you know, I had clients when I was a broker, I had uh, a handful of clients, about eight of them that were uh, Holocaust survivors and the stories I would hear from them. And I got to tell you, Stacey, those people I remembered while I was in prison and when I would start feeling really bad for myself, I would yeah. think about the, their stories and say, who am I to complain? I mean, I, you know, even though the food was terrible, I had food. And even though, yeah. you know, it was overcrowded, you know, I wasn't sleeping in, in a bunk that was 20 to a, a bunk uh, like yeah. these folks had done. So I was trying to look at, if there was a bright side, I tried to look at that. And by helping other people, I was able to help myself. Because if I felt that I was contributing to other people, that yeah. it was making me feel better. Because it's right. almost like a biosmosis. If you're always talking negative, you know, all of a sudden, you know, you feel rotten. And, yeah. you know, on the other hand, if you're always trying to talk about, you know, more positive things, being more optimistic, you know, it, yeah. it kind of pumps you up a little bit. It's almost, I don't want to say equate exactly, but like that fake it till you make it type of thing. And, yeah. um, you know, there is some truth in that, you know, live as, as if I am and I will be. But anyway, right. um, the thing is what you had asked about, you know, coming out. Um, we were talking before uh, we started the broadcast that uh, uh, when I went, before I went in, uh, Skype was the big thing. And mm -hmm. MySpace, if you remember MySpace, that was, you know, kind of the big thing too. Facebook had been out for a couple of years, but it wasn't as popular as it got. Um, but with uh, uh, with um, Skype, you know, there was those interruptions, you know, as you would have the video and, you know, it was freezing, freeze frames. Um, yeah. you know, now I came out and there was Zoom and, uh, of course, COVID, you know, really contributed a lot to people being more used to doing this. But, yeah. uh, you know, I came out, I felt like I, I landed on Mars, as I had mentioned before we started. Um, you know, iPhones had just started to come out. Uh, right. I still had a flip phone when I went to prison. I, I had yeah. to give up when I went to prison, but I had one before. 
Um, uh, iPads had just started getting popular. Um, a TV, when I came back, uh, I was sitting at my, I remember those first couple of nights I was looking at the TV. You ever see that dog? I think it's the old the RCA dog is, you know, mm -hmm. listening to the phonograph or whatever. I remember staring at the TV thinking, I can't believe how clear this is. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. You know, but, um, you know, I didn't know how to work the phone. I, I, my son had gotten me an iPhone. What the hell is an iPhone? I have no idea. You know, yeah. and what do you do with this thing? Um, you know, so it took me uh, a while to really acclimate. But, you know, the, 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 the tough thing was, is that looking at the things that were about me on the internet, you know, I was a thief, I was a liar, I was this, I was that. And that really hurt because that's not who I am. Um, yeah. You know, I've said to people, you know, being in the business as long as I was, I never had a customer complaint until all of this happened. And right. that's kind of, a, I always took pride in that because I was always very careful as to how I dealt with my clients. You know, I never right. lied to them, never would lie to a client, never mislead right. them. And to be painted like that was just like, wow, I went 180 degrees different from where I was and who I was. Matter of fact, I remember the day that the judge sentenced me. Uh, which actually just passed a few days ago, uh, they had a dubious anniversary. Um, he said, you know, Mr. Gain, you look like a nice man, but that's all you are is a wolf in sheep's clothing. I mean, he could have taken a knife and cut my heart out that day. And I remember when I, I, I was allowed to come back home before I reported to prison, and I had a fight for that because they wanted to take me that day. But when I came home, I remember my son, one of my uh, sons and I were talking. He said, you know, Dad, he said, it broke my heart watching what was going on with you. He said, you were anything but that. And, you know, it meant a lot coming from my child because, yeah. you know, they they see the warts and all. I mean, we yes. think we pull the wool over their eyes and I don't care how old they are. They can be yeah. five and they can be 50. You don't pull any wool over kids' eyes. And for yeah. him to have said that at that moment meant a lot to me. It really did. But mm -hmm. um, anyway, you know, again, like I said earlier, I think what we need to do when we when we face setbacks is we have to realize that these are setups for success. Now, mm -hmm. again, you can give up and say, forget this and I'm not going to, you know, whatever. And, yeah. and certainly there are obstacles that are, are maybe impossible to overcome. Right. But if you're talking about business, if you're talking about, you know, uh, a, a personal level, I think that we have to take these 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 difficulties and turn them around. And learn from them. Because yeah. I promise you, in every single case, every single case, there is a lesson to be learned. And if yeah. you apply it, it will really greatly enhance your life. Right. Oh, so true. So true. And, you know, when you talk about taking action, you had mentioned there are certain things that you need to do to take action. What mm -hmm. are some of the things when, when people go through really hard, hard times in their lives you know, and they know they need change and they have to start making changes in their life. You know, what's the first thing they need to do? You know, if they, you know, if they've had struggles in their life, if they're going through hard times, you know, whether it be, you know, work related or life related, what are some of the things they need to do so they could start moving forward? I think the most important thing is, is that you have to realize that there's somebody behind you. Now, I know a lot of people that listen to our podcasts and various podcasts or TV, radio, are really not believers. And I'm not here to evangelize anybody. I can only tell you my experience. Yeah. But whether you believe or not you, but whether anybody believes in God or not, God believes in you. Now, mm -hmm. I call him God. Someone may call him Allah. Somebody may call the, the infinite intelligence, our creator. Whatever, whatever word you want to use, there is a higher power behind us that created yeah. us. And mm -hmm. I mean, even Einstein said that was one of the greatest things that, you know, that, that, that there was a God. But yes. I think that once you know that God is for you, who can be against you? Uh, oh, yeah. The passage in the Bible is so true. Um, you know, if God is for you, who can be against you? And, mm -hmm. you know, I kept looking back at that and saying, you know, Lord, uh, what do I need to do? How do I overcome this? I think yeah. the, number two is to go somewhere and be alone. I'm not saying, you know, disappear for, you know, two weeks or anything like that. But, yeah. you know, go somewhere and just maybe not even think about it. Just get away. Because yeah. what will happen is if you clear your mind, which is not the easiest thing to do, but when right. you clear your mind, it doesn't have to be, well, yeah, I've got this problem going and what am I going to do and how I'm going to solve it. For me, that doesn't work. I just yeah. have to clear my mind. And, you know, for me, I love the water. So if I'm near the water, I kind of get some energy from that. 
but I'm yeah. able to I'm I'm able to communicate with God in a way that doesn't have to be with words. It's just that you know that feeling to know that an answer is coming, and no matter yeah. what, for me, now as you can tell, I am Christian, but for me, I know that that if it's not this, it's something better. I know that for a fact, mm -hmm. and you know I'm not today where I want to be. It's taken a long time. As I said a minute ago, I came home. Thankfully, I was able to come home to my son and his family and live with them for a few years and get on my feet. But I know what it's like to have no money. I know what it's like to want to commit, uh, to commit suicide. I know what it's like for people to treat you badly. I know what it is when you walk by and somebody makes a comment, but you want to turn around and take another action, but you have to keep walking forward. You know, I'm the guy who I, I always say this, I'm the guy who's been there and done that. But, you know, when, when people come to me for coaching, they're getting somebody who really has been there and done that, as I said, because, yeah. you know, I haven't read all of these things in a book and I'm not putting the, 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 the coaches or anything down that have, I mean, I think it's very important to keep up with the education, but I lived it. When I tell someone you're going to get through this, right. I know I speak from experience. I did it. You know, and the thing is, is that we never stop growing, no matter how old we are. And, I, you know, I love the, the saying by Chrissy, uh, um, Clint Eastwood, who said, you know, now uh, Eastwood, I think right now is somewhere around 93, 94 years old. But I love the quote that he had. I never let the old man in. Now, here's mm -hmm. a guy that's still directing movies, as far as I know. I know he, he has recently. So the thing mm -hmm. is, is that when you start this stuff, well, I'm too old. Or you hear people saying, well, the few years I have left with me. Oh, my God. That's horrible. I mean, you know, live for the moment, live for today, have goals, know right. what you want to do and reach yeah. for them. But I really think that when you say, you know, what do you do to to try and get for, go forward? I think it's important to realize that there is a tomorrow. There yes. is a tomorrow. You are going to get to that goal. And sometimes, yeah. you know, I, I say this, and I may have said this on our last uh, podcast, you know, God allows things or it's his will. There's yeah. no two ways. It's, it's either he allows you, you know, he knows all the things I used to do that I would hear something. I, I call it the Holy Spirit, but, you know, people call it that still small voice or their conscience, whatever. Yeah. But the thing is, is I would hear things. I didn't pay attention. You know, some of the people that I hired that ended up, I ended up getting in trouble because yeah, I had heard don't hire them. I, I heard and I went ahead and did it anyway. Or, you know, I, I decided because I was kind of smart. And I don't really need all this, this advice. I'll do it my way. Well, we right. see we're doing it my way. But the thing yeah. is, is that, um, you know, God either allows us to do things or it's his will. And believe me when I tell you, it is a whole lot better doing God's will. And oh, there's yeah. prayer and things come in and we can talk about that another time. But, yes. um, you know, I, I really do think that it's important for people not to give up. And I do right. think that it's important to build a foundation. I know we talked yeah. about this a little bit before we started today. And if you don't mind, I'd like to kind of expand on that. Oh, please do. <laughs> Excuse me. You know, when I came home, and I'm only mentioning myself because this is what I want to talk about as far as right. foundations. I had to build a new foundation because the foundation that I had was long gone. It was everything yeah. was gone. And um, I, I realized that in order to build a home and, and have it sturdy, that we need a, a strong foundation, a good base. Right. Mm -hmm. And what I did is I started to construct that really from the very, very bottom. How was I going to pick myself up and go yeah. forward? Now, you remember I, I had mentioned I wrote a couple of books in prison and they are on uh, on Amazon. Uh, now, mm -hmm. I did have them published when I got back, but um, I've actually written three books. So one I wrote last year, the latest one uh, on managing money, because even though, as I mentioned before, the, about the doctors not losing their, their intelligence, I didn't yeah. lose what I knew about managing money. So I wrote right. a book as to, you know, how to do that in, in layman's terms, very easy English. Yeah. And it's called Manage Money and Avenue to Wealth. But anyway, I thought I'd throw that plug in. But, um, you know, but the thing is, is that I had to start by building that foundation. Well, how do you do that? Well, you have to know where do you want to be? What does the house look like? What do you want it to look like? How right. how far is, how how much do I have to build on this foundation? How big do I make it? How, right. how, how thick are the walls? How many, you know, uh, girders are in there, you know, right. and, and, and I had to, I had to decide what did I want to do with the rest of my life? Now yeah. I could have, you know, I, I could have just sat around 
And, you know, said, well, you know what, I can retire and I don't have any money, but, you know, I'll get Social Security and, you know, I'll just have some potato chips and maybe walk around the neighborhood once in a while, sit on the porch and, you know, play with my grandchildren, which are all great things to do. But if you rely mm -hmm. and you you uh, put your life around that, it's kind of a wasted life, I think, in my opinion. Yeah. So what I was doing is I was, you know, starting to get active in uh, on LinkedIn. I had a presence on LinkedIn you know, years before, um, as we speak right now, I've got, um, I think close to 9,000 followers on, on LinkedIn. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I got somewhat involved with Facebook only, you know, more for my uh, family and extended family in that. Uh, and then I get requests, you know, from people that I used to know. So that, 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 um, cloak, if you will, of, uh, disgust kind of yeah. has, you know, gone away. But, you know, doing, um, you know, doing charitable things, I tried to be involved with, uh, you know, with um, uh, people going into prison. I started an organization called Prison Ecology, and mm -hmm. I invite people, strongly advise people to take a look at that, uh, th that organization. I have a board of directors, board of advisors, excuse me. We are uh, in the process of turning uh, Prison Ecology into a nonprofit. Um, we're not looking to make money put into our pockets, nothing the matter with that. But that's what, why we're, that's not the reason I should say that we're starting it as a uh, nonprofit or turning it to a nonprofit, I should say. The reason that we want to do it that way is so when we go to a symposium or conference, then none of my board of advisors who will become a board of directors at that point will have to dig into their own pockets to go to these things. So the money will be there for them. But, you know, maybe if I, if, if I could just mention a little bit about prison ecology, um, before I went to prison, uh, you know, of course I was scared out of my mind. I kept believing at the beginning that everything will be fine to find out the truth. Yeah. I'll be okay. I never believed that. I kept picturing that I was going to go to prison because I was so scared. And right. I really tried not to let people see how scared I was, but I was. And, um, I, you know, I, just before I had gotten sentenced a couple of months before I gotten sentenced, uh, I had gotten uh, a referral to a prison consultant. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, you know, when I talked to this guy, uh, you know, he was telling me how he could, you know, maybe keep me out of prison. And, you know, if I had to go, it wouldn't be very long. And if I go, maybe he can get me to a place close to home. All the things that I wanted to hear. And, yeah. you know, drowning men, as you know, you know, will grasp at anything. Yeah. And uh, he wanted $5,000. Well, Stacey, $5,000 to us back then literally could have been $5 million. We didn't have 50 bucks. Literally, we yeah. didn't have the money, but my extended family, you know, put money together and we got him the $5,000 and I thought, oh, thank you. Oh man, this is great. So, you know, a couple of weeks went by after we got him the money and uh, I didn't hear from him. So I finally called up. I was excited. You know, when are we going to get going? He said, well, you know, he said, what I want to do is I want to get all of the letters together that we're going to send to the judge. So I'd like you to say, have everybody that's going to send a letter send it to me and I'll forward it to the judge. I said, well, I've already done that. The judge already has the letters. Yeah. Oh, he said, I said, so what else are we going to do? Well, you know, you're dealing with the federal uh, federal law system here. and That's pretty much all I can do. I said, wait a minute. What, what about all the stuff that you told me? Yeah. Well, you know, yeah. You know, now that I think about it, we really can't do much because, you know, they have their own system and blah, blah, blah. My wife, I was married at the time. My wife was livid because, again, that $5,000 could have stretched a lot. Yeah. And she called him up and she said, we want our money back. Well, I don't give refer uh, refunds. He, st he stole the money, in my opinion, from somebody who was so desperate and couldn't afford it. And he wouldn't give the money back. And when I while I was in prison about eight, nine months before I came home, I thought, you know, I'm going to put something together and make sure nobody goes through what I went through. And not only that, but, you know, especially white collar guys, you know, they walk into prison unless they're a Bernie Madoff who kind of knew what they were doing for many years. A lot of guys yeah. get caught up and uh, they had no idea that they were going to go end up their careers in prison. So yeah. I knew how strange it was for me. I knew how scary it was for me. So when I started putting this course together, uh, it was uh, for prison, what I ended up calling prison ecology. It was yeah. really to help people that were coming into prison and trying to avoid all of the things that I went through. So what yeah. I was able to do is put a 110 page ebook together. Uh, when I got back to the uh, back home, I put a PowerPoint presentation together and then I organized this company to make it where, you know, when people are going to prison as a mentorship, that they could come yeah. to us. We don't charge for that. 
Uh, we, right. we have no no fees at all. Uh, we partnered with the Christian community nationwide. So, you know, our money is derived from different places like that. But the thing is, is that I wanted, again, to, to make the path for someone else a little easier than the path yeah. that I had. So, you know, when I started, when I came home, and I'm, I know it's a long answer to what your question was, but that was one of the things that I was able to focus on something to try and make a positive change. And by helping other people, as I mentioned earlier, it was helping me too. It was right. cathartic because I was able to think outside of, you know, just poor me and I can't believe yes. all of this happened. And don't get me wrong. I, I was like that a lot. You know, I mean, I'm human. And I'm thinking, oh, I can't believe, you know, I go to the store and I can't buy this or that, or I look at the price tags now and, you know, I have to put things back and, it, it, you know, it still bothers me after all of these years. I mean, I yeah. live with it. But you know what the good thing was? Is where before I just didn't really care. I just spent the money. Today I, I become much, much wiser. And it was funny because, you know, when I was thinking, what am I going to, I can't go back to my old email. My old email address was capital gain 29 at AOL.com. Well, the mm. reason it was capital gain is I was a stockbroker and yeah. it kind of made sense. And even though, like I said before, my last, our, our, our family name is EO Benishi. Um, you know, when, when my uh, grandparents came to this country, they uh, gave them a name of gain. But the thing is, is that I was able to use the name gain, you know, whether it was capital gain. And then yeah. my point, though, before I came home, I thought, well, what are, I, I need a new website, well, a website, but I also need a new email address. And I kept thinking, uh, what am I going to do? When I, and finally, I, it, one day I remember, I, I thought, gain wisdom, gain wisdom. Yeah, you could gain wisdom. Okay, so that's that's why I pick gain wisdom. Now I have gain wisdom as my website, and um, but anyway, the thing is, that these are all little little steps, the baby steps that I was taking to get back into what I would hope was going to be a normal life again. Um, right. Life will never be normal the way I remember it, um, yeah. but that's okay because now you know my my satisfaction is coming through helping other people, whether it's through my coaching, whether it's through my business consulting, whether it's yeah. through my books. No matter what, you know, and I don't hide from being in prison. I don't like it. I'm not certainly proud of it. But, you know, mm -hmm. you get a bag of lemons. What do you do? You make lemonade or you throw the bag mm -hmm. out and say, you know, I'm not going to do anything. And I couldn't. Right. Do it. You know, I, I it, it's amazing what you've gone through and how, how you overcame it. And I, I love the fact that you actually use giving and helping others to help you grow, you know, and, it, and it's really it's had a positive impact on your life and it's also helped many others. And I think being able to, you know, help others is probably one of the biggest accomplishments anyone could ever feel, you know, and it, it is a very powerful feeling that can really set you on the right track and actually help you succeed is by mm -hmm. giving back. You know, I, I've had, um, I, I, when I, I've spoke, spoken in front of groups, I tell people at the beginning, I have the antidote to absolutely make you happy. I know some of them look at me like I have three heads, but, you know, I say, I, I guarantee, I, I mean, I could put a hundred dollar bill, I could put a thousand dollar bill down and right. I guarantee by the time that we're done, I'm going to tell you before we leave how you can be happy, 100% guaranteed. And mm -hmm. what I tell them at the end is that if you want to be happy, even for a moment, yeah. but if you want to be happy for the day, do something nice for someone. Right. Open, you know, go to the grocery store and buy somebody. You, know, you might not, you don't need hundreds of dollars, but, yeah. you know, if you see somebody struggling, you know, pay mm -hmm. for the groceries. It's $20, $30, right. whatever. Or, you know, buy them a dinner. Right. Or, you know, I, I, I know there was a story about um, at McDonald's. I think this happened in Indiana uh, some years back. Uh, the person um, in front the, the, bought the meal for the person behind. And this mm -hmm. went on like for over an hour and a half, people just paying it forward. You know, there was a movie, I don't know if you remember the movie that uh, came out about 10, well, maybe more than that, maybe about 30 years ago, uh, called Pay It Forward. I would strongly urge people to watch that movie. You talk about inspirational. Here's a little yeah. boy, of course, it was a story, but a little bit, it's a story about a little boy who was able to really uh, pay it forward to help so many people. And the whole idea, for those that haven't seen this movie, was that to help three people. And those mm -hmm. three people to help three people. And then, to, you know, to help three people. So you had yeah. this wide network of hundreds of people that you were helping because of one person. So if yeah. you can spread that happiness to someone by doing something nice for them, I promise you will feel great. And, you know, we've all done that. I mean, back in the day when we used to throw money in the uh, uh, toll booth. Now I know mm -hmm. everything now is done electronically. But, you know, when we you know, throw it in for the guy behind or the ticker taker or 
whatever ticket taker, uh, you know, say, I'm going to pay for the person behind. You know what? You know, I remember a few weeks ago, um, I was at a, a drive through and I was getting a copy and a car came up next to me and, you know, she was trying to get in and I let her in. I mean, it wasn't in a hurry. And, yeah. uh, you know, she thanked me and everything. Well, when I went up to pay for my copy and, you know, she had driven away by that point. Uh, the uh, the kid at the uh, counter said, oh, the, the lady in front of you just paid for it. You know, not only did it make her feel good, it made me feel great, too. Yeah. So, you know, it's the joy that you spread to other people. Maybe yeah. it's sharing your wisdom. Maybe it's sharing your experiences. It's making yeah. someone else's path a little bit easier. And please, this is not my ego speaking. It is not, you know, what a great guy I am. That's not why I'm, I'm, I'm talking about this. It's yeah. just that. If you want to build a, a position of strength, if you want to build your life up, you need to do two things. Help other people do whatever it is that you do and yeah. be grateful for what you have. Because right. if you're grateful for what you have, I, I know Oprah Winfrey had uh, a saying that uh, she's been quoted many times, that if you're grateful for the little things in your life, greater things will come to you. And it's so yeah. very true. Now, when I was in prison, I was writing books. And I was grateful that I had that opportunity to do that because right. I had wanted to write books years before, but I was so busy. I just never got a chance to. Yeah. But when I was in prison, I got back into, into exercising weightlifting again. And I, right. I think I mentioned, I don't know if I mentioned it at the top of the show, or maybe I spoke about it before we started. But, you know, the thing is, is that I used to be a weightlifter and mm -hmm. uh, I got so busy in my career that I stopped and I gained a ton of weight and, you know, I got as weak as a kitten. Um, right. Well, in prison, you know, after I would work, uh, I would head out to the weight pit and I was working out six days a week and I lost a bunch of weight and I, and, you know, I, you know, gained a lot of muscle back. But I realized as I, as I was working out and I challenged the people that are watching today or hearing us today to, to right. do this. If you work out, it is so such a great analogy for our lives, because first of all, it takes commitment. Now, yeah. What does our lives take? It takes commitment. But right. in weightlifting, it takes commitment. It hurts. You don't want to do it. I'm, I don't feel like going today. But you, you know, you trudge out that door and you go to the gym and you, you, you know that you're doing something that's going to make you healthy. And instead yeah. of, you know, having the aches and pains, you know, as you get older, I mean, we see some of these people that are in their 70s and 80s and, and some even older that are running and stuff. I mean, that's that's amazing. But the yeah. thing is, is that the analogy of, of, of weightlifting is so applicable to our lives because if you start out small, which you have to do if you're starting out. Matter of fact, I wrote a book about it. It's one of the books that I wrote in prison was called Unchained and Un, uh, Unbroken, uh, Life Lessons and Strength Training from a Jailhouse Gym Rat. So I, in that book, uh, I talk a little bit about you know what happened in prison and my experiences. But again, this is not, you know, what was me. But yeah. intermixed with that was how to how to weight train from the very, very beginning to the person who's advanced. But the thing right. is, is that um, in that book, I was able to convey to people the analogy between life and about, you know, working out. And again, right. it's the commitment. It's it's doing the hard things. It's building that base. And, and, and as I said before, you know, when you first start working out, you can't yeah. go onto the rack and, and and press 175 pounds. I mean, maybe you can, but I know I couldn't. But the thing yeah. is, is that most of us, most of us mere mortals are not going to be able to do that. So you start out with an empty bar and yeah. you learn the form and you learn wow. how to lift and whatever, whether it's, it's, it's uh, you know, bench presses or squats or deadlifts or whatever, you start out in a very, very easy way. You learn how to do it. And once you right. learn how to do it, you gradually keep putting more and more weight on. And that's how you get strong. And you're not going to get, you know, I see, and it really bothers me when I see this, you know, on, on, on some of these videos where, you know, in 30 days, we're going to get you looking like that. That's, <laughs> trust me, ain't going to happen. Um, <laughs> it, it takes years to do. You know, it's like yeah. losing weight. I want to lose weight. And, uh, you know, it, it, I can do it in 30 days. Well, yeah, you can probably lose five, maybe 10 pounds in 30 days. But, you know, it's going to take a lot of sacrifice. But it's over and over and over. It's knowing that foundation. What do I need to do? And again, yeah. you can apply it to weightlifting. You can apply it to cardio work. You can apply it to your life because it's mm -hmm. going to take the repetition. But the big thing is it's going to take the commitment. You have yes. to commit. You have to make that goal and say, this is important enough to me that I'm going to do whatever it need, I need to do to take yeah. action and to get to my goal. Right. Exactly. Exactly.
And then let me ask you another question. How did you not give up? You know, you know, there's so many times when people just say, can't take it anymore. I just, you know, I've had it. I, I can't, you know, and they just <clears throat> give up on life. They give up on everything. They give up on any plans or any hopes or any dreams they had. And they just nix it and they go through life and they're totally miserable, but they just don't see themselves moving forward. They don't know how anymore. They just given up. You know, I, the answer I'm going to give you, I know is going to sound hokey to some people. But again, as I mentioned earlier, I can only give you the experience that I had. Yeah. I always knew that God had my back. And I gave up a lot of times. I I, I can't do anymore. You know, right. I was married, as, as I mentioned. And um, my wife and I, I adored this girl. And um, uh, it, we lasted about 14 months. And then she left. And uh, you talk about giving up. I mean, I remember the first night that I got to prison, uh, the very first night, and I put my um, my shirt over my my face and I was crying my eyes out. And of course, I'm trying to muffle all that because I don't want everybody else hearing me. And yeah. uh, I swore at God. Stacy, I called God the filthiest names. I've said this to other people. I, call, I called God the filthiest names and swore. And I'm shocked I didn't get struck, struck dead at that moment. But, you know, the thing is that I kept saying, you know, you you and I both know the truth. How could this, how could you allow this to happen? How can this happen to me? Not only that, but I died. And you brought me back to this knowing that I was innocent. And it didn't matter if anybody else believed me. It, it just didn't at that moment. And I wanted to give up. And, you know, when 14 months later, when my wife left, I wanted to give up. I, I want really. I wanted to take. I uh, just wanted to end it all. And I remember that day. Um, you know, when I knew it was finally over, I, I remember looking up at the ceiling and saying, "God, what do you want to take my kids now from me? I mean, is that the next thing you want to do?" And I was. Mm -hmm. I was mad. I was really mad. And I just. You know, I don't want to do anything. To give up is doesn't mean really to give up. It means to regroup. And I think if we realize that that you know if if we allow. You know, if we allow negative people around us, mm -hmm. you know, you will give up. So I think yeah. it's really important not to be around people that are always moaning and groaning and complaining. That is yeah. so important. Stay away from those buzzards because yeah. misery does really love company. And, yes. you know, it, it happens when, you know, when we go to a new job, especially when we're young and we start yeah. a new job and, you know, you, you get the complainers in that office or that factory or whatever, and they don't like the boss and they don't like the company and they're going to do this and they're going to do that. And you try to fit in. It happens in school, too. You try to fit in. You don't want to be different at that point. You right. don't want people not to like you. So you right. start drifting along. And when you're drifting along with these people, they are not helping you at all. So the mm -hmm. thing is, is that for me, I, I can't tell you exactly why it was that I didn't give up, but I know after a day or two or maybe an hour, depending on, you know, what the setback was, uh, you know, I was just always that type of person that said, well, you know what, I'm not going to give up. And I remember before I left prison, when I was at church, we used to, um, in church inside the prison, uh, you know, we would give uh, whoever was leaving, you know, say prayers for them and give that person the opportunity to um, you know, to speak to the group. And even though I was, you know, in charge of the music ministry and everybody knew who I was, uh, I I did the same thing. I got up in front of everybody, and I'll never forget when when um, you know, I have all these guys in in attendance that day, and I said, you know, I said nobody will ever understand you the way I do. Yeah. Nobody will understand me the way you do. And I know people that have been in the armed forces are like this. We can't understand. If you haven't been in the service, you can't understand what they went through. You think you do, and you kind of do, but you really right. don't. But I said to those guys that day, I said, I want you to know, I promise you that I am not going to walk out of here quietly into the night. I said, I know a lot of you guys know my story, and a lot of them did. I didn't go around telling people I was innocent, I was innocent. And that's another fallacy. Everybody thinks that everybody in prison says they're innocent. That's not true. You know, the old urban legend is everybody gets a tattoo in prison, uh, everybody finds Jesus, and everybody's innocent. And I promise you that is not the case. But guys did know my story. They, of course, would look you up, even though they're not supposed to do that. But the thing is, is that... Um, I remember saying they put the wrong person in prison or a person in prison when they did that to me, because mm -hmm. again, I was not going to walk quietly into the night and I right. haven't. And you know what? That gave me, that was another thing that really gave me purpose. I am yeah. going to make certain that this is not going to continue. This mass incarceration 
that this country was was you know going toward was not yeah. going to continue. Even if I could keep one person out of prison, even if yeah. I could give one person a lesson as to how to behave and what to do in prison, even if right. I could make one iota of difference, yeah. I I was going to do that. And it gave me purpose too. And I think that's the important thing is that all of us need to have a purpose. And yeah. when you have a purpose, you don't give up because you've yeah. got a purpose. Yeah. So true. So true. Now, if you had to take everything we talked about today, what are some important things you'd like to emphasize? Again, I think that it's important to to stay around people that are, are optimists. I, I know that not everybody is. Um, try to look at the bright side of things. I think it's mm -hmm. so important to keep our minds occupied in the right way. Um, you know, there, there's a saying, as the mind goes, so does the mind, so does the uh, body. And it's true. I mean, if you, you doubt that, uh, you know, when you're driving, just look to the side of the road, especially if you're on a throughway going 80 miles an hour. Look to the yeah. side of the road. If you keep your focus on the side of the road, I promise you're going to head to the side. You just will. You know, mm -hmm. and I, I, an analogy I use in my book, uh, Chrysalis, is about going over a bridge. You know, all of us have bridges that we go over, whether it's a river or wherever, a creek, a canal. And, you know, we probably, if we're on a throughway going 50, 60 miles an hour, um, yeah. then we go over to that bridge and never think anything about it. Right. But you have to understand that your imagination is the most powerful tool that you have. And you can use it for good and you can use it for bad. And yeah. that bridge analogy, you know, you go over the bridge and I'm sure, Stacy, you do too. And you're going over there 50 miles an hour, 60 miles an hour, because you know you're not going to fall over. You got all right. those guardrails and all of the. What if they took the guardrails off? Right. How far? How fast do you think people or me or you would go over that bridge? I doubt right. it would be 60 miles an hour. Not right. because I mean we've gone over it dozens of maybe hundreds of times in our life. Yeah. And we never had we never touched the guardrail, but if yeah. that guardrail wasn't there psychologically we would start to see ourselves going over the side. I, 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 I tell people, put a plank down on the ground, make it four feet wide, make it five feet wide and mm -hmm. make it 20 feet long. And you could yes. walk, you could run across it. Yeah. Take that same plank. And I really, I, I challenge people that are listening today to do this, at least in their mind. But yeah. take that same plank that you ran across and put it up between two 100 story buildings and then walk across it. And people won't do it. And they won't do it because they think their imagination is I'm going to fall. Maybe mm -hmm. they might crawl. Maybe, maybe they might if it's wide. <laughs> wide. But, you know, the whole thing is going to be our imagination tells us that we're not going to we're not going to do it. So yeah. always have positive things in your mind. Always have things in your mind that are uplifting, because if you focus on that, you will yeah. accomplish it. And it's not easy to do. So I'm not out here saying, hey, I'm, uh, you know, making a hundred million dollars a year again. Yeah. Not that I'm ever dead. But my point is, is that, you know, you've got to be realistic. But I think right. you have to step back. I think you have to get away from, like we talked at the top of the show. We have to step back and be alone for a little bit. And, you know, this is not a one process. This might right. take weeks, might take months, might take years. Yeah. Everything is different for each one of us. But the thing is, is that if you're able to get away, and I'm not talking about, you know, just turning on the TV and chilling out or, you know, grabbing your phone and looking at TikTok while you're, you know, supposed to be contemplating. Go away, right. put the stuff, leave the, leave the phone in the car. Whoever is important, they'll call you back, you know, right. and you can call them back. But the mm -hmm. thing is, is that you need some alone time, whether it's 30 minutes or an hour, I would say it, it should be at least an hour. But yeah. the thing is, get away and allow your mind to relax allow your mind to become part of who we really are and that's part yeah. of god 100 percent. that's so true now tell everybody some of the services that you have to offer yeah i um as we mentioned uh, i'm a performance coach a life coach i only deal with 12 clients a year and uh, the reason i do is because i try to devote a lot of time to them uh, an hour a month and um the reason i do that is i ask people to you know, send me in whatever they're doing for that week at the end of the week to let me know what we need to adjust, what we need to kind of tweak. Um, and I do public speaking. I, I do that for groups and churches and so on. Uh, I also am an author, as we know. And um, I really, at this point, I, I'm a business consultant as well. So I, I don't deal with a lot of people at any one time or a lot of companies, I should say, at any one time. Uh, because I want to give my full attention to that company. So I don't have like three or four companies that I'm dealing with uh, at the same time. It's just one. But, um, you know, I give it my all. 
And uh, I'm able to, um, I'm able to balance that. And then with my board of directors or excuse me, board of advisors with Prison Ecology, uh, we meet every other week uh, for about an hour, hour and a half and mm -hmm. discuss what's on our mind, what we're doing. We're and right now actually uh, putting a um, newsletter together so we can send it to people that are inside and uh -huh. it'll have pertinent things in there that are really important. Uh, in, in the group, we've all been working on that together. And, you know, one of one of my uh, board of advisors had given me uh, something that here I, you know, tell people I was an inmate or whatever. Uh, you know, there's new vernacular for that. There was people that were formally incarcerated. So instead mm -hmm. of, you know, like uh, inmate, a former inmate or whatever, uh, the new adage is people that were formerly incarcerated. So, you know, again, we're always learning new things. And mm -hmm. um, that's really what I'm working on right now is what I just mentioned. And I'm also involved in a, a prison advocacy group in my church. And, um, you know, I, I, I devote some time to that as well. Oh, I like that. Now, tell everybody about the the books that you have right now that you've published that are for sale. Yeah, uh, my uh, the book that I mentioned before, uh, Unchained and Unbroken, Life Lessons and Strength Training from a Jailhouse Gym Rat. Uh, that's available on Amazon. And certainly somebody can write to me at guy at gainwisdom.com and I can send them a book. Uh, also, um, uh, Chrysalis, uh, that book is, uh, I don't want to say it's scripturally based, but there's a lot of scripture in there. And, you know, we can talk about this on another podcast about all of the things that Jesus had said in the Bible about faith and about having faith, about not yeah. doubting, believing. And that is a, that really is just a, can devote hours to that. But I speak right. a lot about that and how to accomplish the goals that you're looking to accomplish. And uh, that book took me two years to write, actually. Uh, but that's Chrysalis Awakening to God's Path, Protection, and Power in Your Life. And then uh, my other book that I finished last year, uh, which is an e-book, uh, that's uh, Manage Money, an Avenue to Wealth. And and by the way, when you asked about what, what I am doing, uh, I also publish a weekly market update and give people, even though I'm not in the business anymore, uh, I give people uh, guidance as to where to put their money. But I especially did that to the people that are working in retail that really don't have anybody that, you know, no broker or anything that tells them where they should put the money. So, um, you know, actually this week uh, is a free week. And uh, you can go on the site. We have all of the uh, past posts. Uh, I started this back in August of, of 2022. And uh, every week is in there. And, um, you know, there's some pertinent information. And it's all, again, easy, easy reading. But it tells people where they should put their money, what's gone on with the markets over the past week, where I see things going in the next week, and uh, so on. So, but uh, yeah, they if, if, if somebody would like, they can write to me at Guy at Gain Wisdom. Dot com, And if they'd like to write in, I will send them an ebook uh, for free. And, um, you know, they just have to write in and give me their uh, email address and I'll make sure that they get a free copy of that. And if anybody buys the books, uh, any of the books, uh, I donate 15% back to your uh, ministry of whatever that is, whether it's a ministry or whatever you want to do, uh, it right. does go back to you. Oh, that's so nice. And where can people find your website? Gainwisdom.com. Very easy. Gain, G-A-N-E, wisdom.com. And that's where I am. And then all of the different things that I'm involved in uh, are on that site. You can go to Prison Ecology from there, which again, Prison Ecology has its own uh, website. That's prisoncology.com. Uh, um, the um, uh, money management, that's at marketwatch.gainwisdom.com. Uh, but that, again, is is on my website. So you can navigate through there, and there's a lot of information there. And um, again, all of it is geared to helping other people because, again, that's what my mission is now. I love it. I love it. Well, this has been amazing. Thank you so much, Guy, for coming on the show. I really appreciate your time. And this was really valuable information. I think a lot of people, you know, need to hear your story and they need to also learn how to take action and move forward and not right. give up. You know. you know, before we hang up or before we end, I should say, you know, I think it's important that people know that all of us have a story. All of us have had setbacks, but, you know, mm -hmm. setbacks are set ups for our future. If you do it the right way, if you look at these as, opportunities to learn and to grow. And, you know, you learn more from your failures than you will ever learn from your successes. You know, I was very successful for so long that I forgot some of the lessons that I should have learned. I had to <laughs> learn mine the hard way. And my whole goal right now is to make sure that the people that I talk to don't have to go the way I did and certainly don't have to learn the hard way as I did. 
I love it. I love it. Well, thank you so much. This has been amazing. Thank you. And you're an amazing person. And I appreciate, I, I appreciate you. Yes. Stacy, you bring out the best of me. I'll put it that way. <laughs> you're only as good as the host, believe me. I believe me when I tell you that. So I thank you. Uh, so, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Well, you have a, a great night. And you thank too. you so much, Aaron. And thank I, you for everybody for tuning in and listening to us. And uh, again, if there's anything I can do, please feel free to reach out. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. God bless. God bless you also. Have a nice day. You too.